So with that, I'll throw this out and say, why don't we, so there are only a couple of issues that we've raised here today. Um, we could do this for a very long time, but let me throw it up to open to, are there questions or issues that folks would like to talk about? Knowing very little at all about what we call the farm deal, on a national level, does the farm deal address some of these issues that you talked about as far as helping solve the problem? Um, so the Farm Bill, for th folks who don't know, the Farm Bill is the federal piece of legislation. It's, an, it's omnibus le legislation. It's 400, and, it's, it's about that thick. It does, it, so the, an the short answer to your question is yes and no. Um, there are parts of the Farm Bill that do good things, and there are parts of the Farm Bill that do bad things. Um, and so, you know, people will often come to me and say, is the Farm Bill good or bad? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, it is. So, so, but what we can say is that in this farm bill, in the current farm bill battle and what was passed with the fiscal cliff deal, what was maintained was by and large subsidies for large scale commodity crops, corn, beans, cotton, soy. What was whacked, what was cut, was by and large conservation programs, things that, that supported conservation efforts that people do. Um, nutrition programs took a significant hit. And a large number of the rural economic development and alternative development and a lot of the things that did, you know, the organic program, the, the, a long list of smaller scale um, um, the programs, the beginning farmer programs that really pay for training for beginning new farmers. Uh, lots of the things that try and get at these broader issues were really left on the floor um, in this last deal. So uh, I can say that this one's rough. Actually, it's sort of the opposite of status quo. It actually is in ways, a lot of things that we've had for a while were actually cut, a lot of good things that we've had for a while were actually whacked and cut out this time around. So, but that's, we could talk for a long time about farm bills. So. To answer your question as a farmer, it's probably hurt us as organic farmers more so than giving us any help. We'd, we'd be better off if, if they'd eliminate it probably because just like she was talking about the land loss, well, we 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 rent our land. We rent about 350 acres. Well, we've done significant improvements over that last uh, 15 years that we've had that land. In other words, we've done land smoothing and reditched it and done a lot of improvements. Well, once we made those improvements, then my convention, my conventional neighbors, all of a sudden, want to go to my landlord and want to double the rent and stuff like that because you know they can benefit from the farm bill because they got these sprayers that spray 120 foot or stuff like that so they need more additional land to justify having that $200,000 sprayer and that $400,000 combine and so to answer your question in an indirect way it's hurt me more than it's helped in any way as a farm. Yeah, I think for labor, it didn't do a whole lot of good either. I don't think it's the answer to for farmers. I don't know it's not the answer for farm workers. Um, farm workers here locally are competing with the H-2A program. Um, we have a lot of US-born farm workers now, um, or second generation farm workers, and they can't seem to get a job directly with the grower. Um, they're working with a labor contractor. And then my kids are told, you know, when I say my kids, I'm, I guess, old, but my kids are anywhere from 12 to 21. Um, my kids will say, the contractor will tell them, you're not allowed to talk to the grower. If he comes around, keep your mouth shut. You don't speak English. You know, things like that. There's just no, there's no reason for that. There's no reason why the grower comes around and says, hey, how y'all doing? You need, you got enough water? <laughs> that they can't say we're 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 doing all right, you know, but they can't. So I think in the current environment, I don't think the farm bill addresses that at all, and I don't think it's the answer for what ails our rural communities a lot of times because all of this has overflow in in our religion-based community as well. And let me just say that the religion-based community, the religion-based community in, in my community, which is the Kinston community, has. 
Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Harvest Connection, Disaster Relief Ministry. You know, for years they fed, they served our family's Christmas dinner. Um, they were the only gift that our kids got. The van that we use is from Grace Fellowship. Our religion-based community is traditionally more conservative, but has been the forefront of all the activities and getting our kids to graduate high school and our gardening and everything we've done um, in our community has been super strong. And I'm really proud of that. And I'd love to see a lot more of that. Um, there's a lot to be done and a lot of more people who need to be made aware. But and to answer your question, no. Farm Bill doesn't work for us. And I would just add that there have been a series of discrimination lawsuits against the USDA, starting with the Pigford discrimination lawsuit, which was for African American farmers. There's currently, then there was Keep Siegel for Native American farmers. Love and Garcia were consolidated representing Hispanic and women farmers and ranchers in that process. The Hispanic and women farmer discrimination claims process ends this March. I put that on the table because the fact that those discrimination settlements were settled, uh, you know, there was rampant discrimination that was taking place, uh, you know, throughout all of USDA's loan programs and other services. And there was just so much solid documentation about the fact that when folks would, farmers would go in and complain that they weren't getting their loan funds, they were not getting even applications to apply, much less the opportunity to sit down with someone and have them review an application. It was just so well documented that these settlements uh, came out of these lawsuits. I say that because a lot of people in the Senate and the House think that because those settlements were agreed to that all of the discrimination that has taken place historically throughout USDA over the past 100 years has you know been just wiped away magically and, and has somehow disappeared. And so one of the initiatives under the Farm Bill to address it from a policy approach was the 2501 program for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. Now, that program, <laughs> that program is just, it's not very popular. And I'm pretty sure if it's not completely, completely gutted, it will be very shortly because people really get confused about the fact that those settlements did not reach the people who ha actually had the major losses. There were some farmers that did get their $50,000. And even we're seeing with the Hispanic and women farmers that a lot of women farmers won't even recognize that what they experienced was discrimination. They just, you know, when they were told, don't come, you can't come in here without your husband or come back with your brother and then you can apply, that was discrimination. So one of the challenges that we're having, um, you know, addressing it from a policy perspective is having those programs cut because the assumption is that these discrimination lawsuits are addressing them, but we can't even get the farmers around the table convinced, farming is a hard lifestyle, <laughs> you know, and I think all small farmers have been discriminated against because of their income, if, if not, you know, their wealth status. And so when you're talking about socially disadvantaged and you're talking about farmers of color and women, it becomes really difficult. And one of the things I'd really like to see the faith community do is address the fact that our church services are really segregated. Our communities are really segregated. And because of that, we don't really understand how connected we really are. Like our humanity is so connected. Our reliance on farmers for our food is fundamental to our existence. If you believe your body is your temple, your farmer is a steward of the land. I, I believe that, you know, people of faith can really easily understand how connected we are. And so I think it's time for us in the South to really have these conversations in a very frank way because without having this dialogue, without seeing ourselves as truly equal, it's modern times now, like let's turn the page already, you know, and not just superficially, not just the Secretary of Ag saying that it's a new era of USDA, but let's actually practice what that looks like in our communities so that we can collectively buy from our local farmers. We can, if you can't afford a CSA share, you can have, you know, a, a buyer's 
collective from your church or something like that. And so I think there are ways that we can put into practice what our faith is and also supporting not just our farmers, but our, our health, our, our investing in our, our livelihoods um, as well. Oh, sorry. One of, excuse me, one of the things that, one of the major things for diversity in farming is access to capital. If you'll see what's been happening in the farm bill over the years, uh, FSA has been the lender of last resort, but you, you'll, you'll see continually that those funds are diminishing. And, and so, you know, where, where is that expansion going to come from? The biggest obstacle we have, period, is access to capital. And without the USDA as that lender of last resort, uh, we won't see a, a great expansion in, in, in small farm diversity. Just for a second, I want to pull out a, a, a theme that I'm hearing a lot of here, which is this, the, the, the overarching industrial system of agriculture is one that puts a great deal of pressure on efficiency and reduction of costs. For the most, for the for the lowest price, the you know the, the downward pressure on price, it's very well you know and and that pressure of economies of scale to increase efficiency. So a lot of the stories that you hear today are either dealing with what happens when you consolidate all of something into one company or one person or one group's hands and then have to deal with that, or what happens when people have to deal with that pressure on themselves to reduce prices, reduce costs, reduce all those things. I mean, that's where what drives a lot of the challenges in, ter in terms of labor, in terms of a lot of these other things. And so the part, of, part of what you're hearing here is the, the human cost of that drive for efficiency and low price, for your low price superstores, or for your low price, you know, for your 99 cent chicken, right? And so, so what we're, I, I think if I had to sort of pull out a theme, this shift from that pressure for consolidation and efficiency and decreasing any kind of cost is something to be minimized. So if you're, even whether it's a person, whether it's a farmer, whether it's the land, or whether it's an animal, it is, an, it is a cost to be minimized. And I think what we're all here trying to say is, no, it's a person. No, it's a home. No, it's a piece of land. It's, it's a community. It is not a cost to be minimized. And so that's, I, if I, as I listen to all of these groups, Benny, how many discrimina discrimination cases do you have right now? So we have six active discrimination cases now. So if somebody, if somebody tells you, no, that's old news at USDA, let us know, we'll introduce you. Um, are, are there, there were other questions. So I just, I just wanted to sort of pull that out. Yeah, go ahead in the back. Uh, my question is for Kenny. Kenny, you said that you've been, you went organic about 26 years ago, which I like that population is long before, well, I guess, the green movement or the push that we're hearing now for organic goods. Would you talk some about what led you to move your farm to an organic farm? Yeah. I managed corporate farms for about 20 years. When I was 29, I was managing a 6,500 acre vegetable farm in Virginia. And the, my preacher who's sitting out there, Vicki, and I were talking about it on the way down here this morning because we left at quarter to five. But there was no aha moment. It was just a series of, of things. Well, on that corporate farm, you know, I had 2,400 acres of tomatoes and, you know, it was all vegetables. I had 150 acres of carrots, 1,470 acres of asparagus, 1,200 acres of sweet potatoes, and that was just the main crops. And I had other crops besides that. But interest rates went to uh, like 20 one percent or something like that about 1980 81 russia invaded afghanistan and jimmy carter was president well they they walked in from corporate headquarters one day the gentleman's name howie weinstein a harvard graduate or something and he was a numbers cruncher and he just walks in one day and says uh 
you know, we're closing down. I said, what do you mean we're closing down? We got crops in the field. And he said, well, just keep the people that you need to harvest the crops and let the rest go. I said, but some of these people have been here all their life and they're like 50, 60 years old. He says, oh, just give them two weeks severance pay and let them go. And so I would, you know, learn real quick about, you know, corporate agriculture and like Scott was saying, these people are human. You know, I mean, I knew all the, you know, the people that were working for me, I got to know them, their, their families, their kids' names, you know, I knew they had, you know, car payments, mortgage payments and stuff like that. And so it was a cold, hard fact. Well, then I moved to North Carolina and managed a farm down there and I worked for a, a gentleman that bought 23,000 acres in North Carolina and he owned uh, 13 fertilizer plants and sold a lot of chemicals and stuff like that. Well, I have never, my wife said I've never been satisfied with anything, so I like to change things and we were using like um, a gallon an acre of Roundup, I mean not Roundup, uh, Lasso. You know, we were broadcasting it. Well, I thought that was kind of wasteful, so I like banded it and cultivated it. It was cheaper and I you know, was cutting costs that way. Well, he came to me, what are you doing that for? I said, we're cutting costs. Well, these other farmers are gonna see you doing that and they won't be buying the chemicals. And, you know, he was more interested in, in selling the, the chemicals and, than he was in, you know, protecting the environment. So I learned another lesson there, you know, well, everything ain't what it appears to be, you know. But, we were farming in the northeast corner and we got dishes every 300 feet you know for drainage and even though we were doing everything according to the label and stuff like that you say you plant corn or something and then you get a heavy rain well the next day the ditches would be full of dead fish and stuff like that and so you know i knew that was not uh, you know my pers uh, purpose as a farmer to you know, to kill all the fish and stuff like that. And so the gentleman I was working for, we kind of parted ways and as, you know, because I was a thorn in his side and we just didn't agree. So we ended up parting ways. Well, my wife is a registered nurse and she'd been telling me for years that, you know, that I was farming the wrong way, you know, that she was in the health field and she could see the results, you know, and the patients that she, you know, took care of at the hospital and stuff like that. And so uh, I was, I think I was like uh, somewhere around 40 years old, something like that. And uh, we decided to, I could either move, you know, as a, get a farm job somewhere else as another farm manager, or we could start on our own. And so we started, we rented 10 acres of land we had one small 14 horsepower, one road tractor, and it was paid for, so I went to production credit, borrowed $4,000 against the tractor to buy the seed, and um, we started farming. And she said, you know, if I was gonna do it, and the only help I had was my three children, they were like 10, 12 years old, something like that, <laughs> that, you know, there was no chemicals gonna be used, and so, that was 26 years ago, and we've since, you know, grown uh, a little bit. And we farm about 350 acres now, and uh, like I said, we don't do any produce anymore because of, um, you know, just like I said before, but getting back to the concentration, I think if you look around, you look what happened in the banking industry with the concentration. I don't know how many of you saw uh, Frontline that, um, on the public television station a week or so ago, they had a thing about the banking industry, you know, how they, nobody has pulled any time or been sentenced for any of the wrongdoings that they did because they're too big to fail and if they prosecute any of them, it might bring the economy down and stuff like that. So it's like they're lawless. You know, well, the same thing is going to happen with the, with the, the meat industry, um, the whole agriculture industry, if, if somebody doesn't stop it. I mean, we've already been down this road one time, back in the 30s, 
Um, they had monopolies and stuff, and they wrote laws to break them up. So history is repeating itself, and we're all just standing around saying, gee, isn't it wonderful? We got cheap food. You know. There's, uh, if there are one or two particular pieces of North Carolina legislation that you all can point to in, your, in the areas that we talked about that we should be paying attention to and, and writing our local representatives about. <laughs> I mean, I know that's a big question, but I just it's a huge two or three that you might name. That's a huge question. One that we're active on right now is in the next two years, North and possibly faster, North Carolina is going to is going to pass legislation um, on the extraction industries. Um, a lot of it is about a lot of it is being couched in terms of hydraulic fracturing, and because that is so heavily concentrated in the middle part of the state, lots of folks in the east and the west aren't really paying attention to it. But what they don't realize is that they're laying out the regulatory framework that is for all extractive industries, not just, not just natural gas and hydraulic fracturing, but offshore oil, um, a whole series of things. And so in eastern North Carolina, these natural resources issues are going to be huge. Access to water is going to be huge. There's a report about two years ago that said you're having, so as water is sucked out of the aquifer, what you hope is that it gets replenished by groundwater. But instead, in eastern North Carolina, frequently where it's replenished is by seawater. And there's actually seawater incursion that's come almost as far as Greenville. And so eastern North Carolina, and especially around Greenville and some of the other towns, that's a huge draw of water. And we're seeing absolutely increasing uh, competition for, between, um, between development and industry. And so these issues of natural uses of natural resources of the extractive industries especially the fracking stuff but also who who controls and who gets access to the water both of those are huge issues which are pretty wonky i mean seriously this is wonky stuff um talk about legislation that'll make your eyes glaze over but we are going to pass legislation on both of these in this general assembly session um I think for us, the biggest realization in terms of legislation is, um, I don't know how many people follow federal DOL stuff, but there were some hazardous orders um, that were suggested. This was for corporate farming um, industries about not allowing them to use 12 year olds anymore um, because it's re really is kind of, it's really not a good idea in corporate industrial farming to use a 12 year old on small farms I don't there's no problem with it I mean they go out there and make sure they've got water they got lemonade they ate something they got some rest they got some shade I mean we're talking to two totally different ways of farming okay industrial farming does not need a 12 year old employee doesn't need it it's dangerous there's not enough accountability Industrial agriculture in North Carolina, as was mentioned, has next to no rules, no regulations. There is no workers' comp. There is no overtime. There is no protection. OK? So I would ask that you pay attention to that. I know that we tried in 2011 to pass the CARE Act, and it did not. It failed. There was a debate. Um, amongst advocates who are other agencies besides us, but they were debating whether you should be 13 or 14. Um, the agricultural industry wanted the 14 year olds in the fields legally. We asked that everybody under 15 be removed. Um, it ended up being an attack, it was broadcast as an attack on small farmers that nothing could have been further from the truth. There was a clause in there specifically that said you are exempt if you are a small farm. But yet they utilized that and they made out that kids were working, were, gonna, were not allowed to feed the chickens anymore. My kids' days start at 4 a.m. My kids' days end at 9 p.m. 
These children work unlimited days and unlimited hours when school is not in session. And they have to do that to feed their families. They have to work alongside parents and siblings to what? Make a living. The annual income is 11000 a year for a farm worker in the state. So my suggestion would be to please pay attention to those issues. It's legal in North Carolina as young as 10, in most cases 12. It happens every day in Lenore County, in Wayne County, in Greene County, Wilson County, Bladen County, everywhere. In every single county out of economic necessity, these children are not protected. So I would ask that you pay attention to that kind of legislation. We're a member of the Air Property Retention Coalition, and for those of you who don't know what air property is, it's what happens when you don't leave a will or you don't have an estate plan is the state's intestacy laws come into play and determine who your heirs are and how your land becomes owned in the next generation. So what you see after a series of generations of a lack of estate planning is you can see like 300 heirs that own 15 acres of land, and a lot of times those heirs live, they don't live in North Carolina anymore. The families aren't even that close anymore because it's been a series of generations. And what can happen is a developer, and this is very true of Eastern North Carolina, developers would send a letter to a cousin that lives in Los Angeles and say, I'll pay you $2,000 for your one 386th share of an interest in land in North Carolina. And this person's like, 2,000 bucks, yes. I don't even know I'd had family or land in North Carolina. It's like the, the dead uncle, right? Um, and so people will sell that share to the developer and the de developer can then petition the court for a partition sale. Now under the law, there's supposed to be what's called a partition in kind, meaning that you need to take a map and you draw boxes around each person. But 350 people on 15 acres, it's just not financially feasible to do that. So what they'll do is they'll have an auction. What happens at the auction is the highest bidder wins, just like any auction. Now what we've tried to do is address the fact that there are oftentimes family members living on that piece of property, working that property, that have been paying the taxes for years. But there's no way for them to disassociate themselves from those relatives or now that developer who has stepped into the shoes of that relative. So it's like you going to a soda machine, purchasing a Coke, and then being able to sell shares of Coca-Cola on the stock exchange. So that's how, that's how powerful the, the share system becomes uh, generations removed from the land. We've tried to get legislation passed that addresses the fact that if there are relatives that are living on the land, if there is a, a, a connection to the land that exists with the original, you know, with, along the original line, that that be in some way privileged or prioritized in the sale process, that the family get a first bite at the apple instead of just being bought out by a, a developer Developer, that never happens. That legislation never gets passed, even though some of our partners have gotten it to get passed in other states, because there's actually model language that says, can you at least consider the family's history uh, and the fact that there, are, there is a livelihood at stake here? And North Carolina um, has been really resistant to that legislation. So we're going to try it again, and we're going to try it again and again. And so when you hear about it, if you hear about it, please, we ask that you support it. We need to wrap up to be able to respect everybody's time. I'm going to throw in actually one other thing. What's it? Are those on your website? The things that we just mentioned, some of them are, some of them are, and, and the aired property issues on the land loss website, and we can and we'll connect to it. And um, the other one that I would throw in is um, Betty. What did we figure out? We about 80 percent of the farms that we serve who are facing foreclosure, healthcare costs are a major driver of that foreclosure. So you already heard in Kenny's story this the importance of the connection of health with our food and how food is produced and 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 the concept of health as a driver for connectivity, connection, and all of these kinds of things. Well, health is also a driver, what we see very frequently, especially among a lot of the younger farmers, the, the people coming in, we see a lot of them either uninsured or underinsured. So that, and, and farming is always in the top five. A few years ago, I read an article that said that farming had just passed circus performing in the list of most dangerous professions. And so it's always in the top five. 
And so, and, and also for Melissa's, for Melissa's folks as well, these healthcare issues are huge ones. And there is major legislation passing now on um, the state's role in Medicaid, the state's role in, in the healthcare programs. And this is a huge driver of the economy. And a lot of farm folks, you know, there's a, always a joke about, you know, uh, they want to farm, but but the you know one of them's got to teach school in order to get in health insurance. I mean, it's, you get that all the time. So, but I want to I want to stop. We're a minute or two over, and I want to respect folks' time. Let's. Did you have a quick? I just have a quick one. What can faith communities do to help move uh, toward instead of the bottom line, a triple bottom line of people, profit, and the planet? What can faith communities do? Uh, engagement. I, I mean, the thing that comes to mind. Just finishing this up. I think that. Just to wrap up, I think what we're hearing a huge amount of is the importance of interconnection. A lot of these things happen because of disconnection. It's disconnections of communities. It's disconnection of people who produce it from folks who eat it. It's disconnection of people who labor in it from the folks even who are producing it and the folks who are. It's disconnection of people, disconnection of communities, disconnection of places. And what we're talking about is, is reintegration. And so there are, I, I would say, a couple of things. One is there is a rural life committee of the North Carolina Council of Churches that engages on a lot of these issues. We meet every other other month. Uh, Rob Webb at the Duke Endowment convenes that. Chris Lou Beers from the Council of Churches also convenes that. I think I can, I am safe. It's often held at our shop. I think I'm safe to saying anybody here would be welcome to come, but if you can't make that trek, it is engagement. It's engaging on some of these issues. There is such a drive of language, of the language of disconnection that we see so heavily now that coming back with the, the, the lang even the, just the language, but this very important part of the conversation. And I want to thank all of our panelists. Thank everybody, and thank you all for being here. <laughs>